without much further ado, I'd like to bring Dave up onto the stage uh, and uh, give it up, guys. Give it up for Dave and Che. Che and I had a chance to sit and chat the other day. Um, we'd never met, so I kind of wanted to talk to him and get a feel for not only where he is now, but where he's kind of come from, you know, things that happened in his career that kind of shifted him in one direction or the other. And there was a lot of really interesting stuff, so much so I needed to take notes because there was way too much to talk about. Um, and I was going to go over some UA stuff to kind of start, but I think I'm going to forego that and just kind of dive right in because we've got a lot to kind of talk about. Um, but when we were talking, I always like to find out how people get into, get into the world of recording, music production, wherever they kind of start off. And we were talking, he said he had gone to college, so I immediately assumed for music production, you know, uh, music theory, but you went for? Finance. For finance, which is awesome. Um, and then from there I said, well, how did you get into the music side of it, production? Yeah. And, and you had kind yeah. of an interesting story about that. Um, a good friend of mine, he actually ended up being a big program director for years at a, one of the top stations in New York, was a DJ when we grew up together. And he started being a DJ at like 12, you know, 12, 13. So I think he sort of gravitated to the DJ side of things, and I gravitated to the music production side of things. So like well, simultaneously, as teenagers, you know, we were athletes, we played, you know, everything that teenagers do. But he was literally you know, studying radio and how to be a DJ and he wanted to be a radio disc jockey and all those things. I was doing the other. I was like learning, like really dissecting records and trying to understand like why would, you know, what would the relationship between the drums and the bass, you know, and, and just really learning and learning and learning. But I didn't have any equipment. I would just like literally go to music stores and just be there for hours and they'd probably be like, would this kid just get out of here? You know what I mean? Like, and just like, just hang out in music stores. Yeah, yeah literally. And just ask questions and start really any and i asked every musician that i knew questions so just started learning and learning and learning and learning and that's where it started yeah and then it transitioned into actual music production getting into recording creating getting yeah. into that whole world and then you hooked up with with teddy riley yeah and yeah. now now it's a great story <laughs> how you got connected with teddy riley another fantastic i might date twist. myself with this age thing but um i sort of came up in the age of like the big car stereo systems where guys were customizing their cars. So I had a good friend in college who did that and he just would ride around. And I think he was, you know, just in his own way, I think he was proud of me. So he would literally ride around just playing my tracks and like just driving through no vocals, just instrumentals, just driving around playing my tracks. And literally one day he, um, he had a, he knew some of Teddy Riley's people and so on and so forth. So he pulled in the parking lot playing my tracks Teddy came out of the studio and was like, what's that? You know? And then he was like, oh, it's a friend of mine. And then from there, that yeah. led into working with... Yeah, that led into a contract with Teddy, uh, which, you know, and it just went from there. You know, it was like a leap of faith, so to speak. He offered a contract. My dad was, like, supportive, you know, because I hadn't finished school. I still needed to finish school. And he was kind of like, well, you can always come back and finish school if it doesn't work out. So it was like a leap of faith. I really owe it, I mean, to Teddy and my friend, but also to my dad. You know, he's real supportive. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's the rest of history. And that would, as yeah, they say. Well, not quite. There's still a whole list of stuff here. But yeah. um, well, that so was the start. That was the start. So from there, you ended up, you headed north to New York. How did that yeah. come about? I think um, a lot of us sort of got our start down there. I mean, Pharrell and Chad were from the area. Timbaland and Missy were from the area that I went to college in. Um, so it, it became, it ended up being like this melting pot of all these people, these really talented people. And, um, and then we all kind of went North. We all like, even though they were based in Virginia, it was like New York was kind of like the hub, at least on the East coast. So we went, went to New York. Um, I met a lot of different people, I think from, from being around Teddy and, and just, and, and also just being in New York. Um, I formed a, a relationship with Wyclef who was uh, from the Fugees. And um, I ended up working with Wyclef. And that was like my first kind of New York sort of gig, if you will. Yep. Yeah. And then you also worked with Destiny's Child. Yeah. When, with Wyclef is when I yeah. first started. I would say Teddy was my introduction into the music industry and learning about really song structure. And I feel like I'm, I learned the difference between what, what a track was and a song with Teddy. But I didn't actually get any placements with Teddy like I was working for a year and it, and it was great it was like it literally was like boot camp I guess 
And then with Wyclef, he was, you know, coming off the success, the success of the Fugees and so on. And it was like a really vibrant time going on in New York. So we did. So I got opportunity, all these opportunities. And um, I did Destiny Child's No, No, No. I did Ghetto Superstar. I did a bunch of records in this time. And not necessarily knowing quite what I was doing yet, but I'm, but I was starting to get, you know, starting to get traction. And it was during this time that you were exposed to a lot of the the great analog equipment that was yeah. in studios at the time. Yeah, this was still the time of tape. Yep. This was still the time of Simpty. This was still the time of, you know, what going through various pre's to, you know, try to get to the tape as fat as possible. And I I, I would say this is the the time of the knock, where it was all about trying to literally blow out someone's speakers you know i mean like that was the challenge every time like who had the best knock and so it was like you literally sat there for days running drums through different pre's and you know because we we you know we were just learning all this studio gear so we're really learning how to manipulate it you know to this day like you know a neve 1073 is still one of my favorite things in the world just because of that 